Good morning, everyone. Before we get started with worship, let's, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. Now, there's so many things that you do in our life that we are unaware of. Your hand touches us in so many different ways. And your blessings just rest upon us. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your great mercy. We thank you for your great love. So we ask for your blessing this morning. Would you be with us as we lift your name in worship and praise? We ask, Lord, that you would just anoint our pastor and the word that he brings to us this morning. And we'll give you the glory and the honor for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we go.
John chapter 16, Jesus makes the statement to his disciples. He said, it is better that I go away. You've got to remember that for three years, the guys have been living together. They've been together this whole time. And they've watched Jesus do some, some things that no one has ever done before. He saw him calm the waves just by speaking to them. He, he saw him raise people from the dead. And he spoke with such authority. No one in history had ever, had ever seen that, ever done that before. So when they when they when he says to them it's better that I go away. I mean if I'd have been standing there I'd have said how is that better? Jesus said this. He said if I go away then the comforter will come. What they didn't understand is that Jesus in the flesh in the person him gone then God himself in spirit would be with them as he is with us right now today. We are going through some horrendous stuff. We are seeing some things that, that are unheard of for our time. I know if we look back in history, there's some pretty frightening events that took place. Where a lot of people died of sickness. We have a God who, who loves us. We have a God who has a plan for our lives wants to tell you that this morning. So take heart. Don't be discouraged. It's God himself is with you. God in spirit is with you. Believe in his word and trust him when he says, I am with you. one word. 
this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living. in spirit and Lord God we lift our voices to you and we look for guidance in this time and Lord God you are the air that we breathe you're the food that we eat you are everything to us and Lord God though we're going through a, a chaotic time there's a sickness upon the land Lord God both a physical sickness but also a maybe a spiritual sickness as well. We know that you are the ultimate healer, Lord God, and we're looking to you for all these things. So Lord God, today, as we draw near to you, we have confidence that you have already drawn near to us. Lord God, those going through this time that are living with fear and anxiety, Lord God, we know that 
that you are the author and the finisher. We know that we have confidence in you and you alone. So, Lord God, touch lives right now. Those that are physically sick, Lord God, we pray a touch on their lives. Lord, we pray for our our leaders as as they're walking through something that they've never walked through before. We pray for our our healthcare people, the doctors, the nurses, everybody involved, Lord God. We ask for protection upon them and, and we lift them up to you. Holy Spirit, we ask for your move upon this world, Lord God, because this is a this is a world thing. It's not recognizing borders. Just like you don't recognize borders, Lord God, we pray for a overall harvest into your kingdom. So regardless of, of, of the virus and anything like that, Lord God, we look to you and we pray that your word continue to go out, that you continue to touch lives, Lord God, in this time where it's uh, seemingly hopeless in some people's eyes, we have hope in you. And Lord God, we know that when you're involved, Lord God, All things are made new. All things are possible. Great things happen. So, Lord God, we lift today up to you. There is none like you. And we glorify you today. Pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And and everybody out there said, Amen. Well, once again, what has... uh, been looked upon as very unnormal. It's a, it's a changing time, online church. Um, I always believed in online church. I always thought, what a great way to reach people. I just never knew it would, it would come to the point of really being the only way to reach people and to, to convene with the church. But welcome. Um, welcome, everybody that's online today. Um, I sit in my same seat on the front row, and I have my phone open, and I have it going um, on Facebook Live. And I, I, uh, it's less about watching the service and more about watching who's tuning into the service. So every time one of you pops up and it says, so-and-so is watching, man, I love it. It makes me makes me feel a connection with you guys. So keep it up. Keep watching. Um, share the video. Start a watch party. Let's make this um, a huge thing. I'm not saying just this church. I'm saying any service. Let's, let's post it as many places as, as we can. We have an opportunity right now to, to uh, reach people who have never set foot in a church or have a fear or or something about coming into church, man, they'll, they'll click it on Facebook, um, our YouTube channel, whatever it might be. So continue to share, continue in, to encourage people, say, hey, man, you should check this out, and uh, maybe they'll just watch a little bit of it, maybe they'll watch the whole thing through, but, but that's something that we can be doing now to further the gospel, to, to be connected, to, to, to let the church go forward, because let me tell you, the church is going forward. That's something that will never be stopped. Uh, with that being said, today's uh, Palm Sunday, it's a, it's a, it's a representation of, of the triumphal entry. It's a day of, of triumph. It's a, it's a day of excitement in the Gospels. But we also know during the Holy Week between Palm Sunday and, and really um, Good Friday, a lot of things happen and a lot of things change. Just like we're living in a time that, that things are changing. There's one thing that stands true is is God's promise never changes. The cross never changed. Jesus never deviated from the cross. So during this week of of Holy Week, though though we are apart, um, though we can't meet together, um, we can still focus on God, man. Be getting into your Bibles. Be getting into the Word. Um, be discussing it with your families. Get on chat groups on Facebook and, and texts. And just let's talk about Jesus and the things that were going on. Now, a lot of you probably have questions on how next week might look with, with uh, the calendar date. Uh, next week is is Easter Sunday, and and uh, I, I've thought about this a lot, and I've prayed about it. There's different options. I know different churches are doing different things. The one thing that we know is is that we still um, we still aren't going to be able to meet together at church. So really, my idea, and and I think this is what we're we're going to do is is next week I'll do an Easter message. Um, 
an online Easter message. We can all gather online once again and, and, uh, and celebrate this time. But Easter changes every year anyway. It's on a different date anyway, right? So it's not necessarily the date that is so special. It's, it's, it's what Jesus accomplished that we're celebrating. So my idea is, is that when we get to come back together and meet, which we will, we can never lose sight that we will be together again. On that first Sunday that we meet together, we are going to celebrate Easter on that Sunday. And man, we want to do it up. I hope this place is overflowing. I hope we run out of chairs because we are so excited to be here on that first Sunday back and to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, again, I want to do it up. Let's have a meal together. Let's have inflatables. Let's have games going. Whatever we need to do, it's going to be a glorious day when we get to meet to back together. And it's probably a glimpse of heaven when we all get to heaven, right? And we all get to reunite and meet together. So, uh, so kind of keep that on your radar. Keep that on your book. That's, that, to me, is how Easter this year should look. You know, all the different options. It's still not the physical contact that we need. And like I said, it's going to happen. We just don't know quite when. But as soon as we know, we'll start announcing that. For the, so that first Sunday back, man, we're going to have an Easter celebration. It is going to be great. Like always, um, you guys have the opportunity to give online if you feel like, man, that segment of my worship has, uh, I just, I, it's not the same because I'm not putting my money in an envelope and putting it in the, in the boxes that we have. You can always give online. Um, there's always a link to that. You can always get to that on our website really easy. You can mail it in. We've been getting a lot of, uh, a lot of letters in the mail with, with their tithe checks. Uh, or you can drop it by the office, which we haven't had as much of, because I know a lot of you guys are staying home. So you still have those options. Please continue to give. I was talking to a missionary um, just this last week, and, and uh, a lot of the missionaries are kind of hurting right now because uh, um, churches just don't have the funds to send because they've, they've taken such a hit because of this time apart. Hopefully, We've got the mindset that, that we can still give. So please pray about it and please be faithful in that. Now, last week I put out a video. Um, that was kind of new to me. I haven't done a ton of, of those type of videos. It's kind of like uh, preaching to an empty church. You do a video and you just talk to a camera. It's a little different for me, but I hope you all saw the video announcement either on Facebook or our YouTube channel or, or in the weekly email. If you didn't, there's always ways to get plugged into that. Now, if you did see the video, you know that today we're going to do something that's just a little bit different, something that you've probably never done before. I know personally I've never done something like this before. It's something that I hope will keep our, our minds on community, both with God and with each other. So today is going to be all about communion. Now, you probably know that I believe that communion should always be fresh. That's why every time we do communion, it's just a little bit different. We change it up in one way or another. The, the overall communion message is just a little bit different. See, I never want communion to fall into this repetitive cycle of something that, that we have to do because of tradition or because of schedule. Rather, I want to celebrate communion as I believe it was intended. And as I was thinking about how and even why we would do something so seemingly strange as online communion, I realized that this would be a great time. This would be a great Sunday to, to maybe press in a little deeper into what this whole idea of communion is. What's the aspect of communion? Why do we actually do communion? There's a lot of people out there that, that do come to church, and, and sometimes when it's time for communion and everybody comes forward to grab their elements, man, everybody's coming forward. They jump in, and, and they, they have the idea that, hey, communion is what we need to do, but they don't really have the history. They don't know where it came from. So what a great morning to take the time on this, this Palm Sunday, this beginning of Holy Week, to really dive into to this reason of communion, what's with the juice and the bread and all of those things. So today we're going to do just that. And at the end of the message, we, as a body, the body of Christ, we are going to share in communion, unified in spirit, though we are apart 
physically. Now in the video, you know, I, I, I went into um, how to prepare for communion today. If you didn't catch the video and you're sitting at home going, I guess I didn't know we were doing communion, that's okay. Just run, run to your, your kitchen right now and, and, and grab some juice and some bread. And, and as in the video I indicated, it doesn't have to be grape juice, can be, you know, be a little bit of anything. It's just symbolic elements and, and grab some sort of bread and just hold it now as we will go into that later. Now, the title of today's message is The Last Supper, Celebrating the Unnormal. And we're going to go all the way back to that first Passover. Then we're going to bring it up to the Last Supper. And then we're going to land here today, April 5th, 2020. So I invite you right now, I invite you right now to, to really step away from everything. Step away from, from the news that we hear, that, that we read. Step away from all the other posts on Facebook. Step away from what is going on in the world right now. And let's gain a better understanding of one of the church's most powerful symbolic celebrations. So we're going to jump right into some scripture here. we got a lot of scripture, so if you guys want to uh, write it down, you can follow along. You can kind of go back and reread this stuff if you want. But we want to jump in, and we want to go all the way back to when the Israels, the Israelites, were still in captivity in Egypt. And we find that story in Exodus chapter 12. So if you guys want to turn to Exodus chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1. And like I said, we've got, we've got a little bit of history here. We've got a, we're going to read a little bit here. So, so get ready. Follow along. Listen. Do whatever. Hopefully, if you're sitting here and you're, you're watching with your kids, hopefully this will open up a bigger discussion. And the uh, reality is maybe your kids know a lot more about this story. So what a great time for discussion. Exodus 12, starting in verse 1, it says this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Community, right? Everybody together, all at the same time. Verse 7, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, and the lintel of the house in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in hand, and you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all of the gods of Egypt will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. It's a lot right there, right? It's an amazing story. I remember when Colton was little, man, he must have been like five years old. This was his favorite Bible story. He would tell it to everybody he could. He would tell it to adults. And it was so funny to watch a five-year-old articulate the story of Passover to adults. Now, not everybody knows that the idea of Passover um, 
is related to the idea of communion. We're going to get there in a second. As we read this scripture, though, we can look at this and we can say, okay, right here, right here we have something that's going on in the immediate, right? Uh, Moses and Aaron, they're telling the congregation exactly what to do. They're giving them detailed directions of, of how to do it, why to do it, when to do it, and all those different things. But we also see some foreshadowing going on. Though it is for them right now, it is also foreshadowing things that will, part, that will happen in the future. See, the Israelites were instructed to prepare and perform these steps, especially in regards to the lamb, right? And with the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. Pretty specific things going on here. It is in order to protect their firstborn from death. And to be ready to, to move, right? In haste, man, be ready. Have your shoes on, your belt on, your staff in your hand. Be ready to move. Be ready to move out of, out of captivity. Be ready to move out of slavery. Be ready to move out of bondage. There's also this, this beautiful, greater, eternal picture being painted here. As it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And his blood atoning sacrifice on the cross, which when we accept and embrace Christ and his blood being spilled for each one of us, we are now protected from death, right? Just like they were protected from death. Now we can be protected from death and we are moved from captivity, from slavery and bondage to sin and death. And we are moved from there to freedom, to faith to hope, and to unconditional love. What powerful and vivid symbolism that is going on here. Now look at verse 14. It's still part of the instructions. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Don't forget these things. Though you are, you are doing this now, and, and I'm telling you to be prepared, be ready. Uh, eat, kill the lamb, put the blood up, be ready to go, because we're about to leave this, this, this bondage and, and head into the promised land. Never forget what is going on here. So the Israelites were now to partake in pass, a Passover celebration year after year after year after year, so that they would never forget what God did. Now listen to this. They were to do it in celebrations of, of God's provision, in remembrance of what God accomplished, but because of the foreshadowing of the coming Messiah, they were also to be looking forward to the promise of God. So they're remembering Yet they are looking forward. Now, if we fast forward a bit in, in history, we, we know that, that uh, we go through the time in the desert. Kind of talked about that uh, last week, the time in the desert. And, and then they entered the promised land. All sorts of things happened. And, and eventually Israel kind of settled down and they built a temple, right? They built a temple in Jerusalem. And we see the original sacrifice and instructions that are described in Exodus concerning the Passover. It, it has changed a little bit. It is, it is continuing to change just a little bit. Passover became one of the Jewish pilgrimage festivals. And Israelites were expected to travel from wherever they were to Jerusalem to sacrifice a Passover lamb at the temple. This celebration is described as, as having taken place during the, the reigns of King Hezekiah and Josiah in, in 2 Chronicles 30 and 35. And as time passed, the practice continued to evolve and to change. A number of customs and steps found in, found in Jewish literature begin to increase in the meal which became so highly ritualized that it, it became to be known as the Seder, from the Hebrew word meaning order. 
So the Seder meal, it, it, it has everything to do with the order that you are going to. So many beautiful illustrations in the Seder that point to the coming cross. Yet the risk that they were running is, is that it became so ritualistic that sometimes we can forget the true meaning of something because we're so concerned with the order that we need to go through. Now we have the unleavened bread. And we know that, that, that from the start all the way through today, the unleavened bread represents uh, this, this, this brokenness. It's being broken, right? Wine was served. The diners then would recline, and they would sing hymns, and they would kind of hang out together, all, all being somewhat comfortable and, and focusing on, on this, this order of things being done. During the meal, the Exodus story was retold, and the significance of the unleavened bread and the wine was explained. It was explained to the kids. It was just re-emphasized to everybody. The unleavened bread symbolized the, the affliction, the slavery, and the lack of luxury of the Israelites while living in Egypt. This is really important to understand. That during this time of their meal, they were so focused on their affliction, their slavery, and their lack of luxury of, of these people living in Egypt, right? Before living in Egypt, it, that's, that's what things were. It was all about them. The wine expressed the belief that God will take them out of that, that God will save them from that, that God will redeem them, and that God will take care of them as a nation. Understanding all that, kind of that history. Now let's, let's fast forward to Jesus. Jesus comes, right? Very unexpectedly, Jesus comes. Jesus comes in a way that, that uh, people didn't think he was going to come in. Many of the Israelites thought, man, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to wipe out these Romans. It's going to be all about the nation of Israel. He's going to ascend to the, the, the king of Israel. Man, he's going to rule. And he's going to take care of the, the slavery that we're in. And he's just going to take care of all this. He's going to come in like a mighty lion. But that's not how Jesus came in. He became, came in in the lowliest of ways. Now we see Jesus at the end of his three-year ministry and his disciples. And, and we see the idea of the upper room and this idea of the Last Supper. Flip over to the New Testament. We're going to be in Matthew 26. Matthew 26, starting in verse 17, says this. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus right? That's important. The disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the, and the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So we see the disciples, and they're the ones that are, that are really coming to Jesus. And they're coming to Jesus because they know what's going on. They know what time of the year it is. They're, they're used to those things. So they got the disciples, they're coming to Jesus, and they're, they're asking him, they're basically saying, hey, where, where is it? that we are going to prepare, where do you want us to, to find a spot so that, that we can prepare things, that we can gather things, so that, so that we can all come together and have the Passover? This is important for a couple reasons. It's important because it shows how ingrained the disciples are in the Jewish tradition, right? The, the disciples, they were Jewish people. They were, they were followers of the law. And then Jesus said, hey, come and follow me. I'm going to teach you some new things. I'm going to make you fishers of men. But it shows that the, the disciples are still ingrained with the Jewish tradition. See, Passover is something that they would have never remembered not doing, right? It would be something like, you know, for us, it's like, 
Christmas or our birthday? Can you ever remember not celebrating Christmas? Can you ever remember not celebrating your birthday? It's just something that happens once a year. We look forward to it. We know when it's coming. It's no surprise. It's just something that we've always done. That's where these guys were. Oh, it's the Passover's coming. The date's here. We need to figure out where we're doing it. We need to get the supplies. We need to get it prepared. They know exactly. They know exactly how it is to look because it's to look the same way as it's looked every other year of their life. Nothing changes, right? It's exactly the same. Same food, same same wine, same bread, same stories, same hymns. The repetition of the, the Seder or the order was just that. It was a scripted order to memorize and to follow so then you could continue to pass that down from generation to generation. Where will you have us, your disciples, prepare for you to eat the Passover? Because Jesus, Jesus, we know the routine. It's finally something that we, we actually understand and something that we can accomplish. It's something that we know. What, we know what to get. We, we know how to do it. We know how to set the table. We know how to do, do all of those things. So, so relax, Jesus. Just relax. Just, just hang out. Because this is suddenly, something finally that we can do on our own. Jesus, we got this. Jesus, let us take care of this. Now, if you drop down to verse 26, we come to understand that things are about to get unnormal here. Jesus loves doing the unnormal thing, doesn't he? I believe right now in this time in history, Jesus is still in control. God is still the author. He is still the finisher. But God's doing something a little bit unnormal right now. And it gets us refocused on different things, the important things. Nothing, um, that's exactly what's going on here. So verse 26, it says this. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Uh, hey. Guys, uh, doesn't Jesus know he's kind of going off script here? It's not the way we do things. This isn't how it's done. This isn't the way we've always done it. Now he's, he's adding things. He's changing things around. But that's what makes the Last Supper so incredibly powerful. See, it's important for us to have an understanding of Passover the very first time it's important to have, for us to have an understanding of, of what Passover became because all of those things come together. And then when we read a verse like this in Matthew 26, we understand how unnormal it actually is. See, Jesus, the Messiah, the one who will atone for all sin, is here. And he is the revelation of what the Passover meal testifies to. All this time, generation after generation, year after year, you're celebrating the Passover as a remembrance, but also as a foreshadowing. And now the Messiah is here. He is with you. And he is speaking to you. And that's where the disciples had to say, we got to get out of our normal mode. We got to get out of our repetitive mode. And we need to listen to exactly what Jesus is saying here. We need to gain a deeper understanding of what Jesus is doing here. See, it's not the Passover meal that has been prepared. 
It's the Lamb of God that is being prepared for what is about to happen. This is a monumental shift. It's a monumental shift in history. It's a monumental shift in eternity. No longer are they to remember their own afflictions and suffering in Egypt, but now they are to remember the affliction and suffering of Christ leading up to and during the crucifixion. It's a, it's a moving from this is what our ancestors had to go through to this is what our Messiah did for each one of us. How powerful, how amazing. And they are to celebrate what is about to be the dividing line in eternity where the old covenant ceases and the new covenant begins. No longer under the law, but now under grace. I think about these things. I read these scriptures and all I can say is, wow. Wow, and it gives me chills to think about this. The love of the Father sending His Son for us, for Him to be broken, for Him to be crucified, for the fact that the old covenant that, that, that nobody could live up to, the law that everybody failed under, was about to change. The separation between God the Father and His creation was about to be changed. It was reuniting. The veil was to be torn. It was a time where, where now we can convene with our Holy Father, with, with, with the pure, perfect, loving mediator of Jesus Christ that, was, that is between us. Everything, everything has changed. That is the beauty and the power of the Last Supper. How can one not get excited about that? How can one not get chills about all of those different things? A monumental shift that we can never forget. There's a shift going on right now. Society is acting very different. Things are, are very different. Yet Jesus is the same. The veil is still torn. There is still the ability to repair the broken relationship with our Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. To be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. To be changed. To be in this world. But not of this world. To have a different perspective. See, if the Passover meal is about Israel's history and journey out of Egypt. The Last Supper is about the sacrifice of Christ and the redemption of mankind. If the Lamb's blood on the doorpost and, and lintel signifies a protection from physical death, how much more does the blood of Christ on the cross provide us protection from spiritual death? And if the Israelites were instructed to have their belts fastened, their sandals on their feet, staff in hand, and to be ready to go, how much more should we embrace Christ in our life now while also being vigilant and watching for His return? How perfect are the Scriptures? How perfect is the foreshadowing as told in the Passover meal? God is amazing. Jesus is the Word. The Holy Spirit is the action. And the Father has the plan. The unnormal, the unnormal actions by Jesus during the Last Supper signified the end of repetitive tradition and the systematic acts in following the law. And it moves us into celebrating the redemption of mankind and the re connection between the Father and His people through Christ, our Savior, King, and Lord. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And that's the very reason we celebrate and partake in communion. That's the very reason that when, when communion is held on a Sunday morning, we can't be thinking, oh, it's the first Sunday of the month. 
it must be communion. I guess I better go to church because I need to go through this, this ritual and, 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 and partake in communion. No, you got to get out of that thinking and you got to understand the power and the symbolism and what it causes us to remember and what it causes us to look forward to. Communion should never be taken lightly. And that's why Paul in the Corinthians uh, letter had to address people taking communion in an unworthy way. They'd allowed it to become something that, that was perverted. And Paul had to make that warning, man, don't do this. You're not understanding how beautiful and power, powerful communion actually is. It should never, ever be seen as something that we just do as Christians. It should never be seen as an obligation or a chore. Celebrating the Lord's Supper through communion is a testimony as to who Christ is in us and what he has done in our life. Every single time, including today, when we partake communion, it's a testimony of who Christ is and what he has done in our life, in your life, in your life personally. By taking, by partaking in communion, I am testifying that Jesus' body was broken for me personally. His body was broken for me and that he shed, he shed his blood for me personally. If I was the only one, he would have still done it. It's personal, isn't it? Communion's very personal. I thereby proclaim the death of Christ and all that he accomplished on the cross. We are to do this in remembrance of him. When I take hold of the bread, take hold of that bread, I testify how his body was afflicted and broken for me. When I drink the cup, I proclaim that he shed his blood for my sake. It was the forgiveness of sins. It was the forgiveness of my sins. Past, present, and future. It was the forgiveness of the sins of mankind. So much was accomplished on the cross. I affirm at the same time that I have also received this gift, this gift of, this gift of his grace and his mercy. I'm affirming that I have received his gift that was extended to me. Now understand this. This is really important. Understand that I do not take communion in order to receive forgiveness for my sins. But rather, I am declaring that I have received forgiveness for my sins. Remember, it's symbolic, somewhat like baptism. Baptism is symbolic. I receive forgiveness of my sins when I believe in my heart and I, I profess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that I invite him into my life. This is merely a testimony to what I have done and what is going on in me. What a glorious day to be alive. What a glorious day it is to live under the new covenant where we have a refreshed, a renewed relationship with our Father through, through the beauty of his son Jesus Christ as we are indwelled with the power of the Holy Spirit. What a glorious day to celebrate and testify to Christ through communion. Today, we get to celebrate Christ. Everything else, all the bad news. I don't even like getting on, on my phone right now. I don't like looking at the news. I don't like looking at any of those things because it's just an avalanche of bad news. Everybody's pushing the bad news. Yes, there's things going on, but there's something so much greater going on. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, in a few minutes, we get to testify to that. What he has done in our life. What he has done in this world. We can't not get excited 
about those things. Man, I count it a privilege that on this glorious day that I get to be together with you guys, one another with our family in Christ. I'm, I'm going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you on Facebook Live, on, on whatever, man. I want comments. I want you to say, man, what a glorious day it is. I'm having communion with my family, though I'm apart from everybody physically. Man, I'm with you spiritually. We need to be communicating. We need to be talking. We need to be sharing those things. Text people that you haven't talked to lately. Talk about the glory of our Lord and how awesome He is. Amazing stuff. I get excited about this stuff. I know. I get I get talking fast about this stuff. I don't know. You can probably rewatch this message and, and slow it down a few notches and then I'll probably sound normal. But I can't not get excited about what Jesus has done. So do you have your elements? Have you gathered your elements? I can imagine some of you guys are still in your pajamas. I can imagine some of you guys probably got dressed up. Some of you guys are watching this on a TV. Some of you guys are just watching it on your phone. Some of you guys are probably in the basement. Some of you guys might be walking, taking a hike. Some of you guys might be driving somewhere. I don't care where you are. Do you have your elements? And are you ready to testify and celebrate the greatness of our God? You guys flip over. To 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, like I said before, Paul, Paul talked about communion a lot here. They were, they were doing things in an unworthy manner. He gives a warning to us to not take communion in an unworthy manner. It testifies to the seriousness of this. We don't take this lightly. We, we, we make sure that we are prepared. Man, if you've got anger, if you're in a bad place, you quickly, simply quickly say a prayer right now. Say, God, man, yeah, I've screwed up. Yeah, my mind's been in a bad place. Yeah, I might be holding on to forgiveness. But man, right now, right now, fix me, man. I repent, God. Make me right with you so that I can partake in this communion in a worthy manner. And then we see Paul going in and, and saying, man, this is what God delivered to me. Remember, Paul was not with the disciples during the Last Supper. Paul was, was rampant, man. He was persecuting the church at this time, man. He was an angry dude at all these Christians. He, he didn't exactly love Jesus, though Jesus loved him. And then Jesus brings him to this beautiful point in his life. And, and I imagine God saying to, 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 to Paul, man, Holy Spirit, we got to get this guy up and running. Man, he's got all this knowledge of, of the law, but we need to make it all make sense. So we're going to put him on the fast track here. We're going to talk to him directly. We're going to put him on the fast track. We're going to show him things that no one else has seen before. And we see a glimpse of that in 1 Corinthians 11. Starting in verse 23, it says this. Paul is saying, For I received from the Lord, he received it from the Lord, what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you testify, you remember, you look forward to the Lord's death until he comes. Everybody take their take their bread. I'm telling you this is the weirdest thing so far. I got an empty church and I'm holding up a piece of bread here. But it doesn't matter because I'm picturing all of you guys out there. Man, I am picturing you guys. And you guys are all holding this bread now. Now it says in here, it says that Jesus had given thanks. Sometimes we overlook that part, man. We're gonna hold up this bread. We're going to give thanks, and we're going to remember of all the things, the affliction, the suffering that he went through for 
us, for me, for you, and all those things. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that, Lord, we thank you that you are Lord. We thank you that you are the Savior. We thank you that you are the King. We thank you that you are above all things. We thank you that we can have confidence and trust in you. We thank you. Lord God, that we can love you because you first loved us. And Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you shed your blood and died for us. Lord, in remembrance, Lord God, help us to never forget the suffering, the brutality the, that you had to go through. Lord, the beating, the scourging, the ridicule, the crown of thorns, the nails being pounded into you. The hoisting of the cross. Standing up there. Dying on the cross as people are continuing to ridicule you. Lord God, battling all sin. All evil. All death. Lord God, we remember those things. Lord God, help us to never forget. Never to take those things lightly. Because those things are for each one of us. Go ahead and take your... Take your bread. But boy, it didn't end there, did it? No, it didn't end there. As Jesus now talks about the cup. He talks about the new covenant. He talks about his blood, because that's what changes everything, right? It's the cross. It's the shed blood. It's the changing. The old is over. The new has begun. So we celebrate the new covenant. We celebrate the cup. We celebrate that we are living in a time where we can have reconciliation with the Father, but we are also looking forward to that glorious day that Jesus comes back to his church. Times like these make us focus a lot on that. Man, we look at seasons, we look at things that are going on, and I can't help but say, Jesus, as I can look at the buds on the tree and know that spring is coming, that the season is changing from winter into spring, I can also look at the day and the times, the events that are going on now, and I can't help but think, Jesus, that we are entering a different season in eternity, in this time. So, Lord God, help me to be diligent. Lord God, as I lift this cup to you, Lord God, I proclaim the new covenant. I proclaim your love for me. I proclaim the forgiveness that you have extended to me. I proclaim the relationship that I have with the Father because of you. I, I proclaim that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I look forward to that glorious day when you come back. Go ahead and take your. Take your juice. Palm Sunday. We're going to get into this whole week of really the events that probably would have taken place on Thursday, right? We go into Good Friday. Good Friday is such a weird name for the events that took place on that Friday. And then we look forward. Though things may look bleak, Sunday comes. Resurrection morning comes. Though things right now may look a little bleak, we know that Jesus is there. We know that the sun's going to keep rising. The S-O-N is going to keep rising. We keep our eyes on him, right? Not on our current situation. We're aware of our current situation. Keep our eyes on him. What a glorious day. What an awesome day that we could come together online and celebrate communion. It's something that, that I didn't want to have to put off. I didn't want to have to say, hey, we'll do communion whenever we gather again because we can do it online, can't we? And just like we're going to celebrate Easter online next Sunday, we're going to have a double portion this year. Think about it that way, man. We're going to celebrate Easter twice. We're going to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord twice this year, though we should be doing it every day. So guys, be blessed. Next Sunday, like I said, we'll have an Easter message. Don't know how exactly that's going to look. Keep praying. 
Keep praying for this this to end. Keep praying that we can we can come together. Keep praying for our our uh, nurses, our doctors. Um, keep praying for our president as he tries to navigate through this. Keep praying for pastors who are doing things that they've never done before, and look forward to not only the time where we can meet together as a body, but for the time where we will spend eternity together rejoicing at the greatness of our God. You guys have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Stay well. Shoot me some Facebook comments. Text me. Do whatever. Man, let's keep connected. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.